Hi, and welcome to this podcast on the JERT program. I have three guest speakers with me today. Detective Inspector Peter Yeoman, who has been a member of the New South Wales Police for 35 years and currently attached to the Child Abuse Squad as an Investigations Manager. And Shree Smith, Assistant Director of JERT Operations at FACS, and has been working in the JERT program for 15 years and currently supervises field operations. And finally, Katrina Webb, JERT Health Workforce Development Officer and has worked as a counsellor, manager and clinical supervisor in sexual assault services and is responsible for overseeing the training, clinical supervision and workforce development of JERT senior health clinicians. I asked them five questions. The first question was, what is JERT? Joint investigation response teams consist of staff from FACS Community Services, New South Wales Police from the Child Abuse Squad and staff from the New South Wales Ministry of Health. JERD is a victim support service. We investigate and assess reports involving allegations of sexual abuse, serious physical abuse and neglect. Our units are discreet in order to further protect victims and their families. JERD aims to enhance effective investigative and risk assessment processes. It links risk assessment and protective intervention of community services with the criminal investigation of police and the Forensic Medical Treatment and Support Services of New South Wales Health. Yes, JERT is a process where New South Wales Police, uh, New South Wales Department of Health and Family and Community Services work towards the care and protection of children subject of abuse as well as bringing those offenders to justice. Each of those areas have separate roles and responsibilities, however at various times work together in order to achieve those objectives. What happens during the investigation process? In a police investigation, the first priority is the care and protection of the child. In many of the investigations, police, health and family community services come together at the initial stage in order to exchange certain information and plan outcomes for the fundamental response. Police will then conduct a criminal investigation, which may include, but not limited to, crime scene examinations, interviews of witnesses, medical examinations and interviews of the child, forensic analysis and offender interviews. Family and community services undertake their own process in order for the care and protection of the child, which may include the care proceedings at the Children's Court. Entry into the program is via a risk of significant harm report to the New South Wales Child Protection Helpline. Whether these reports are generated from neighbours or mandatory reporters all reports come to JERT through Community Services Child Protection Helpline. If the helpline assess that the matter meets JERT referral criteria, i.e. that it's a risk of or an allegation of sexual abuse, serious physical abuse or neglect, they will send the report to the JERT referral unit. The JERT referral unit is a central intake point and consists of officers representing Community Services New South Wales Police and New South Wales Health. They review every referral to the unit and where relevant they will seek additional information to inform the accept or reject decision. If accepted, the referral is forwarded to the local JERT unit. The local JERT unit is then required to undertake further planning ahead of the field response. JERT has 22 locations in New South Wales and two different service models. One where staff are co-located, that is Community Services, New South Wales Police and New South Wales Health sit at one location and respond to matters jointly. And the other is non-located, mainly for our rural and remote locations where Community Services and New South Wales Health staff may sit in one location with New South Wales Police Child Abuse Squad staff in another, but they respond to matters jointly. Once a report is received at a local JERT unit, um, JERT agencies again meet to share relevant information. They look at the safety, welfare and wellbeing issues. They may meet in person or, in tel or on teleconference to make agreements about how and when they're going to respond. Sharing of information and planning for local response may engage other stakeholders, and this may include local community service centres, education, NGO, out-of-home care service providers. 
anyone or agency that may be relevant to the investigation and the assessment of the report. The field response is conducted jointly by police and community services staff and usually involves interviewing the child victim, his or her family or carers in the first instance. The field response may also involve the seeking of forensic medical assessments or treatment services. Interviews of children or young people can occur in our co-located units via audio-visual equipment. The units are set up with a specific interview suite. Um, for our non-co-located units, so our rural and remote locations, interviews may be recorded by way of handheld or portable equipment. Interview suites are child-friendly. They occur with either the police officer or the caseworker leading the interview with the other monitoring the interview in an adjoining room. This recorded in interview, thanks to changes in the Evidence Children Act, can become a child or young person's evidence in chief. Not all joint investigations result in criminal proceedings, arrest in charge of the offender, or removal of a child from parents or carers. Getting disclosures from children is complex and difficult, and often the alleged offender is someone known to them. The dynamics surrounding abuse, grooming tactics used by offenders, the age of the child and the severity of the abuse impact on a child or young person's capacity to tell their story. So health's role in the JIRD investigation process is to think about the health needs of the child. The senior health clinician in JIRT will be gathering relevant information about the child's health history and looking at current health issues and planning for their future health needs. This may mean, this may include um, having some input into the planning for the interview process if the child has particular health needs that might be relevant, particularly for example if the child has a disability. Often there might be a need for the child to have a medical examination. There can be two reasons for this. The most important is to make sure that the child is well and okay to meet the child's health needs, but there's also sometimes a need to uh, search for and collect forensic evidence. There are particular time frames that we think about in planning for the uh, medical examination. Sometimes there can be considerable urgency if the child has some symptoms or some injuries that need urgent attention. There's also often some urgency around collecting the forensic evidence and uh, the health worker is um, able to give advice about this. Also to um, arrange for the um, medical examination to happen as soon as possible. An important part of the medical examination is to reassure the child and the carer about the child's health at that point and in the future so that they don't carry forward fears about permanent injuries. Another role of the senior health clinician is to provide information and support for parents and carers during the time while the child is being interviewed. Um, this can sometimes be a slightly lengthy process and very stressful for the carers who might be very concerned about what's happening for the child at that time and what might happen in the future. So it's useful for them to have as much uh, information and support that they require and ultimately that will mean that they're able to better support the child immediately after the interview and in the coming days and weeks. What supports are available to carers during this process? One of the most important um, supports that are available to carers is uh, information around the what's happening through the JERT process and information that will uh, support decision making that organisations and carers may need to make. Uh, it's important that carers and services are aware that they are very welcome to ask questions of any of the JERT um, partners of the officer in charge, the facts caseworker or the senior health clinician um, and they're able to uh, seek the information that they need to help them to provide best support and care for the child that they're looking after. Uh, senior health clinicians uh, provide crisis support for the family, 
for the child and the, the carers at the point of the interview, as I said earlier, but also make assessments and referral of the ongoing support needs for the child and the family that they're living with. Um, this often includes counselling, which may be short term or may continue for the longer term, particularly if the um, abuse has been very severe or ongoing, there might be a need for um, counselling for quite some time. Um, it's very important for carers and others who are, other adults who are involved in looking after a child to be involved in the counselling and the support. This will help them to uh, know how to effectively support the child and to respond appropriately to any questions or further disclosures that the child makes. Um, there can be a two-way flow of information then between the, uh, the carers or the parents and uh, both the JERT team and the uh, counselling support service which will um, make sure that everybody is updated on what's happening for the child and also for the counselling it informs that therapeutic process. What do I do if a child in my care discloses sexual abuse? Whether the child discloses sexual abuse or other trauma that may require a statutory response, you have an obligation as a person who in the course of their employment, whether you're paid or voluntary, and you deliver a service to children, you have an obligation under the Act, if you have reasonable grounds to suspect a child is at risk of significant harm, to report that to the Child Protection Helpline. It may be a child, it may be a class of children, but if you believe on reasonable grounds that the information they're telling you is risk of harm, then you need to report that to the helpline. If you report the information to your case manager, under the legislation they also have a responsibility to report the risk of harm to the helpline. So don't assume, because you've shared the information directly with your case manager, that the information has been reported. Please talk to your case manager to make sure that if the information is required, that it has been sent through to the helpline. Personally, I believe that any person, whether public or otherwise, believes that a child is at risk or has information that a child has been abused, they have a responsibility to report that information through to the helpline. Legislation clearly dictates that where an NGO or other body charged with looking after children is aware that a child is at risk of significant harm, for example, sexual abuse, ill treatment of a child, lack of medical care, basic physical or psychological needs, the matter is to be reported to the Child Protection Helpline stating the name and description of the child and grounds for suspecting the risk of serious harm. If a person in this position fails to notify, then they be, may be guilty of a criminal offence. As such, full access to the child is mandatory under these circumstances by police, health and family and community services for the care and protection of the child. It should be understood where children in the care of NGOs or any other body they are suspected of committing uh, abuse, that they are still mandatory notified to report these matters to the helpline. To help you, agencies have developed the Mandatory Reporter Guide. This is a decision-making tool, it's an online tool. So if you have concerns about a child in your care and you'd like to know what you should do about it, you can log on to this website and it takes you through a series of questions and it provides you with some guidance and advice about whether your concerns meet the threshold for reporting risk of significant harm through to the Child Protection Helpline or whether your concerns may be best addressed through other services or other action. This tool, however, doesn't replace critical thinking and it doesn't prohibit, so it doesn't stop you making a report if you believe it's appropriate. The most important thing is to listen really carefully and to show your support and concern and care for the child. Um, it's 
it, you can feel free to ask any questions to clarify what the child is telling you, but try not to ask leading questions or, or put words into the child's mouth. It's important though that the child understands that you are, are listening and believing them and that you understand that this is a difficult time for them. Children often take um, some time to disclose so that there might be a significant delay between the time that the, the abuse has happened and the time that they tell. The other thing we know is that children often tell um, via a process so they'll tell little bits of their story over time. So it's important that even if you know that this child in your care has a history of abuse that you don't assume that they've already told somebody what they're telling you right now. It may be the first time they've actually told anybody about it. So um, after the, the conversation it's important to, for you to make notes to help you to remember what the child said. Try and make those notes in um, um, using the exact words, using quotes for what the child said. And to be cautious about who you tell about the conversation. Obviously you'll be needing to make a report, but it's important to keep this child's confidentiality in terms of the other people in the family and the social group. This can be a really difficult time for a carer. You've often developed a close relationship with the child and it's very difficult to hear them talking about things that are so painful. It can also be very confusing and confronting to hear details of an assault, particularly if you know the person the child is um, alleging has assaulted them. Um, it's important that as a carer you uh, seek support about this from your um, case manager and from the, the JERT team when you do eventually have contact with them. But it's very important in this situation to try to minimise um, your feelings so that the child isn't silenced by your response and also to make sure that you keep uh, confidentiality in the front of your mind in these situations. One thing that is particularly important is to resist any urge to confront the accused person or to ask them whether or not this is true. Not all reports of risk of significant harm go to JERT. Um, some require a response from local community service centres. Some may require referral to local police and community service centres and to New South Wales Health. So not all reports go through for a joint response. And what is the NGO's role when a child or young person under their case management is reported or referred to JERT? I think the most important thing to remember in this situation is that for all of us, for the this NGO and for JERT, the well-being of all of the children who come into contact with JERT is our priority. And it's really important then we rely on the support and cooperation of all of the adults who are involved in the lives of uh, children who come into contact with JERT. It's important to remember that agencies or carers' rights to make decisions about a child in their care is limited to those mentioned in Section 157 around care responsibility. Case management and day-to-day -day responsibility for decision-making doesn't include decision, decisions about whether the child in their care participates in an investigation by community services or New South Wales Police. NGOs and carers should be aware that the decision to have the children participate in an interview concerning abuse allegations does not fall within care responsibility and therefore it's not a decision you can make. We ask NGOs to make children in their care available to JERD investigators. It's important that all stakeholders communicate it's important that JERT investigators have timely and unencumbered access to children so we can find out what's happening, we can make decisions about safety and wellbeing and we can provide information that supports both the child and the carers and the agencies involved.